right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, we've decided to start because we have a, a hard uh, finish time. So, unfortunately for others, we've decided that uh, it's better for us to, st to start. So, this is the very last panel of uh, what has been really an extraordinary journey into global uh, affairs from the Afghanistan peace process into the uh, ban treaty on nuclear weapons and, of course, beyond. And I think this uh, sort of extraordinary journey really uh, somehow reflects the dynamism of uh, Pagwash, its membership, its leadership, but also the complexity of the global landscape. And this panel in particular look at the future the future of the uh, nuclear energy market and the internationalization of the nuclear fuel cycle. So it blends together really the two souls of Pagwash, the technical aspects with the policy aspects. And we have two extraordinary uh, panelists with us, two experts that actually have mastered both technical expertise and policy expertise. I also have to say, uh, I am going to make an announcement on behalf of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Kazakhstan. As you know today, the 29th of August is the UN International Day Against Nuclear Test. So at 11.05, I'm going to ask all of, uh, all of us to stand up for a minute to honor the victims of the nuclear testing. Now, without further ado, the very first speaker of uh, our panel is Sharon Squassoni, who is the director of the Proliferation Prevention Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Sharon has a very long, outstanding career, both in government and in NGOs, and she has been a true role model for many of women who actually want to take up a career in nuclear policies. Sharon, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you, Francesca. Um, <clears throat> and thank you to Pugwash for uh, inviting me to speak on this panel. We don't have slides. And, you know, for those of you who follow nuclear energy, to give a talk on nuclear energy and fuel cycle without slides, it's really tough. And actually, I just found this out this morning. So I'm punting. So forgive me if I'm gonna be a little more frank than usual. Okay. Um, hard to believe, right? Nuclear energy is the only way to produce electricity that you can actually weaponize. All right, let's start from that ground truth. And that's why I think in part the continual drumbeat uh, that we heard you know, in the panel right before us and elsewhere about rights, rights to nuclear energy, rights to enrichment, rights to reprocessing, raises questions. Um, coupled with what I would generally characterize as a basic uneconomic activity, which is nuclear energy, which is what nuclear energy has become, and I'll give you some facts to back that up. We don't have a whole lot of confidence going forward. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth a little bit, but it was, it was kind of um, alluded to in the earlier panel, uh, and it's something that uh, CSIS and NTI in a report we did a couple years ago, we laid out very quite clearly what the NPT does not prohibit and why these gaps are a problem, right? The NPT does not prohibit stockpiling highly enriched uranium as much as you want. The JCPOA does, and that's for a good reason. It doesn't prohibit stockpiling plutonium, separated plutonium. It doesn't prohibit producing highly enriched uranium or plutonium. It does not prohibit withdrawing fissile material for non-explosive military purposes. And by that, most often we mean naval fuel. It does not, um, it allows a country to withdraw from the NPT and keep the capabilities that it has acquired over that time. It's really hard to tell a country, hey, give us back that enrichment plant or that reactor. And it doesn't verify when a country develops know-how for nuclear weapons. Because of all those gaps in the NPT, it's been largely up to the suppliers suppliers of nuclear energy to restrict capabilities. And so that's my opening gambit for why you need to worry about what's happening in nuclear supply and demand. And um, I would suggest that 
Um, as I look at the nuclear energy landscape, we have a, a transition from traditional suppliers to new suppliers. We have new recipients and we have some emerging nuclear technologies and those hold uh, potential proliferation and security risks. So as many of you may know, right now 90% of all commercial nuclear power is in what we call the OECD countries, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That's going to shift. That's going to shift to lesser developed countries. Nuclear energy, even though everybody's talking about it for climate change reasons, Right now, it only produces 11% of global electricity generation, and that will decline. In my view, and I know in our working group, uh, many, um, this is kind of a controversial statement, but it's a dinosaur to me. It's a 20th century technology. If you're excited about energy, you're going to look at all those things in the Expo 2017. It's all about storage and renewables, that's where the action is. Um, coupled with that, we have an aging reactor fleet that needs to be replaced. So if you're going to build new nuclear power, you have to replace a lot of the capacity that is going away. So where is nuclear energy shifting to? Obviously, Asia, right? China accounts for one-third of all power plants right now under construction. Uh, and then there are countries in Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Middle East who aspire to nuclear weapons uh, from suppliers. So basically, there's a general shift from west to east. But this will take time because, frankly, there is no nuclear renaissance at the moment. And why is that? Well, despite uh, these motivations of climate change, energy security, and growing electricity demand, the traditional challenges have not abated. So cost, you know, the cost of solar PV, it's gone down, down, down. Cost of nuclear energy, mm, not really. Over 60 years, not really. Uh, nuclear energy also requires a lot of government support. Where you have private industry involved, and deregulated energy markets, they are struggling. This is not just a US problem. On safety, Fukushima costs have been rather eye-opening um, to uh, remediate um, the damage there. On waste, Fukushima shows the link between waste and safety, right? Uh, whereas for so many years, countries were quite content to leave their fuel in spent uh, nuclear fuel ponds, uh, now, dry storage, interim storage, uh, it's looking a lot more attractive. Uh, if you recall, um, for those of you who have been to Fukushima, right, the, the, uh, only the dry cask storage kind of survived the, the tsunami. I mean, it was totally intact. It was just fine. Not so true of the waste ponds. Um, proliferation and terrorism. Uh, I don't really need to go into that. There's a, an expert group out here, but... Um, you know, we still worry about sabotage risks. So, on the supply side, there are fewer and newer suppliers. Um, nuclear power and suppliers are in decline in the West. You name it, Belgium, Switzerland, Germany, Taiwan, they're all phasing out. Even France is reducing. There's a stalemate in Japan. Even South Korea, new construction has halted. Bankruptcy is either looming or forgone for Arriva, Westinghouse, Toshiba. Uh, even in the United States, we had four reactors under construction, two just canceled after they spent $9 billion because the utilities did not want taxpayers to lose any more money. At the same time, Russia, China, and Korea um, are ascendant as suppliers, and Russia has been quite creative in its marketing in terms of financial packages, spent fuel take back, and uh, build own operate schemes. Russia is now building one third of the reactors uh, under construction abroad. Korea has entered the market, although its future as a supplier is uh, not quite as rosy as it might have seemed five years ago, and China is investing everywhere with an eye to future sales. These suppliers play a crucial role in halting proliferation, uh, from national export controls to multilateral 
coordination. In addition to their restrictions in bilateral agreements, states can coordinate their policies under the nuclear suppliers group. Um, and what's most important is an agreement on not allowing the further spread of uranium enrichment and spent fuel reprocessing. Don't get me wrong, this is not a case of the West against Russia or East against West. You know, some countries that caused some significant proliferation problems in the past were Western countries like Germany and France uh, who were selling uh, enrichment and reprocessing. This is ancient history, but it's still relevant. I'm looking at my clock and it says 11.05 for our minute, so we will pause. Thank you. I kindly ask you to stand for a minute in recognition of the victims of the nuclear testing. 11.05 was chosen because uh, the five represents the sign of victory. Thank you. Thank you. Looking at the recipient side, um, I had a beautiful map that showed <laughs> countries interested in nuclear power and overlaid onto that was uh, Foreign Policy Magazine's Failing States Index and there was a large um, overlap there. My only point there is that, you know, nuclear energy is challenging for every single country. Um, and states that are already facing governance issues across the board may find it um, difficult. I, I tend to think that has a bigger impact on safety and security than proliferation, but uh, it's still relevant for us to consider. Um, there are some technical wild cards as we look ahead from laser enrichment to pyroprocessing, fast reactors, even small modular reactors may cause some concerns. Additive manufacturing, um, still not clear how that will affect, but um, I'm going to skip ahead because we're really running uh, short on time. The big question I want I, to pose to you all is do we need more fuel cycle controls? Um, historically, the interest in mitigating proliferation risks of enrichment and reprocessing came from either upswings in nuclear energy or proliferation crises. And only then have countries been willing to consider limits on sovereignty. And I would suggest that if countries are seriously considering massive nuclear energy buildup to mitigate climate change, then it's time to consider limit limiting sovereignty and enhancing collaboration to reduce fuel cycle risks. I think we have to be creative uh, across the board. We have to look at production use and waste of fissile material. And uh, if you're interested, we have a CSIS NTI report on this that had a very comprehensive plan. But I'm going to save time for Tatsu. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sharon. I will definitely have some more time for in, in the Q&A. And now I want to give the floor to Dr. Tatsu Suzuki. Everybody knows who he is, but in any case, he's the director and professor at the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition at Nagasaki University, and is also the former uh, vice chairman of the Japan Atomic Energy Commission. And I believe Tatsu has played a fantastic role in the post-Fukushima uh, phase and really stands again as a role model for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I also prepared uh, PowerPoints, but uh, since we don't have it, so I'd like to shorten up a little bit about my talk. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about three points. The first is uh, uh, current status of the global stockpile of fission material, which is uh, worrying for us. The second point is the situation in Northeast Asia where that the nuclear fuel cycle ambition is still continuing. The third point is then what to do 
I have four specific uh, proposals uh, for the international control of nuclear fuel cycle. So let me start with the global uh, stockpile of fissile materials. Do you know how much fissile materials exist in the world right now? For HEU, do you know how much? 1,338.6 tons. This is the estimate, of course, and uh, which is unfortunately declining. But if you calculate this by uh, uh, the bomb equivalent, uh, Hiroshima bomb is 60, uses 64 kilograms. There is more than 20,000 Hiroshima bomb equivalent. For plutonium, do you know how much? Right now, this is the end of uh, 2015, 511.4 uh, tons. And if you consider this, calculate this, uh, change into the uh, Nagasaki bombs, which uses six kilograms per bomb, it's more than 85,000 bomb equivalent. So the total combined, more than 106,000 bomb equivalent of fissile materials still exist. And the bad news is, it's increasing. For most of the HEU, it's for military. And uh, so the uncertainty is very large. But the good news is HEU stockpile is declining. The bad news is the plutonium stockpile is more increasing. And 70% uh, of plutonium is so-called non-military use, including civilian plutonium. And over the last 10 years, HEU stockpile has been declining about 400 tons. But on the plutonium, a stockpile increased over the 10 years 19 tons, roughly. And the problem is, out of 19 tons, actually 10 tons decline in the military use, but uh, about 30 tons increase in the civilians. So this is the problem of the current status of the global stock biofissile material. Okay, so for civilian plutonium, as you know, the source of the civilian plutonium is reprocessing. As of today, there are four major countries, Russia, UK, France, and Japan, still continue to reprocess spent fuels. And all those four countries have the large stockpile. And Japan, as a non-nuclear bond state, has the largest plutonium stockpile, about 49 tons now. So uh, if you have a reprocessing, we continue to have an increased plutonium stockpile. I think there's a good reason to restrain the nuclear fuel cycle activities, particularly the reprocessing. Okay, I talk about the situation in Northeast Asia. Oh, before that, I just remind you that two years ago, uh, the Pugwash, Pugwash Conference in Nagasaki, the council had a statement like this, I just quote, reprocessing to separate plutonium should end in all countries, including all nuclear weapons countries, whether for energy or weapon purposes. All use of highly enriched uranium in nuclear energy program should end. In view of the international security consequences of fuel cycle decisions, countries need to mutually agree to restrictions on their national sovereignty in making nuclear fuel cycle decisions. This is the statement we made at the Pugwash conference last uh, two years ago. Okay, let's go to the uh, Northeast Asia situation. In Northeast Asia, uh, with that much uranium resources in the region, concern over uh, nuclear fuel cycle uh, supply assurance is very strong historically. As I said, Japan is the only non-nuclear weapon state in the region which has both enrichment and reprocessing facilities. South Korea has been demanding that it should be allowed to reprocessing, such as uh, like Japan, and since 1980s actually in Japan. China is now also considering to uh, uh, start the commercial reprocessing to uh, import large reprocessing plants from France. And uh, uh, from since 1990s, there were the, uh, proposals for various, various regional scheme, corporate schemes such as Asia Tom but uh, uh, nothing has been realized. So maybe it's a good time to rethink the regional scheme um, to restrain the nuclear fuel cycle activities. <coughs> All right, 
then I, my proposals. <coughs> there are four uh, specific proposals I'd like to make today. One is the LEU field bank, which uh, we will uh, uh, see the witness the today's uh, afternoon uh, in Kazakhstan. But I'd like to also suggest similar thing in uh, the region, in Northeast Asia. The second is multilateral enrichment cooperation like uh, Urenco in the region. But uh, in, my, uh, in my case, I'd like to combine those two, LEU field bank and the regional multilateral enrichment cooperation. And third is mutual inspection scheme, which is modeled after the Brazilian Argentine Agency for Accounting and Controllable Nuclear Material, which is called ABAC. This is a mutual inspection scheme for nuclear fuel cycle activities in the region. Finally, uh, I'd like to propose the international plutonium management program for storage and disposition of plutonium. And as long as plutonium disposition continues, I like to also propose moratorium uh, for reprocessing in the region. So those are the four uh, proposals I'd like to make. Do we have one more time? Yes. Or should we stop? Can we go? Okay, yes, I'll go very quickly. Um, combining LU fuel bank and multinational cooperation is the, the idea is following. We should provide incentives to the country who do not dis uh, who, do, who decide not to have an enrichment facility. So uh, uh, the country, if the, if, you, the, if the country declare that we will not have an enrichment capacity, they have a right to uh, have a LEU fuel bank in their own territory. That is the best nuclear fuel assurance uh, for a country without any uranium resources. Um, on the other hand, the country who uh, decide to have enrichment capacity they should have an obligation to provide the funding for the fuel bank or even some of the capacities for that enrichment should be used to produce a fuel bank. So this is a combination of the incentives to the countries who do not, um, who, it's better not to have an enrichment capacity in their own, then they have a fuel bank assurance in their own territory and then the uh, enrichment capacity, if you have enrichment capacity, you have obligation to provide the financial funding and also have a, a specific production uh, capacity to be devoted to uh, LEU fuel bank. That's the, my uh, rough proposal. Uh, it is clear that the uh, enrichment uh, uh, capacity right now is, is uh, worldwide is abundant, so uh, unfortunately, the, even if in the Northeast re region, the new enrichment capacity is unlikely to be competitive uh, with uh, existing uh, LEU suppliers. So uh, uh, the cheapest, this is the LEU fuel bank, is the cheapest and the probably best assurance for the local uh, countries in the region. Okay, so mutual inspection scheme uh, uh, modeled after ABAC, uh, I'm sure there are many experts here. And the possible merits is, of course, regional monitoring and inspection scheme could reduce the regional concern over the uh, nuclear fuel cycle activities in the region. And it will enhance regional cooperation in other areas, such as nuclear safety or security and research activities. And we, of course, this will collaborate with the uh, uh, IAEA and uh, uh, this will increase the international confidence uh, of the nuclear fuel cycle activities in the region to the rest of the world. And one more uh, unique thing about this region is, of course, the uh, DPRK. So if DPRK decided to dismantle nuclear weapons program, this regional scheme would be uh, one way to verify the dismantle process of the uh, DPRK nuclear weapon program. Okay, finally, uh, the International Plutonium Disposition uh, Management Program. There have been a proposal uh, uh, about uh, uh, putting the uh, plutonium under the International Atomic Energy Agency's custody. And I think this is a good time for, for Japan to think this option because this will reduce the international concern. And then also, uh, there are already specific proposals made by the United Kingdom the uh, UK has offered to take title of uh, uh, foreign-owned plutonium stored in the UK. So if you, Japan should pay, but uh, uh, this is probably a, a better way to manage the plutonium store in the UK. Roughly, 
19 tons of plutonium store in the UK. Instead of taking back plutonium in Japan, this will be a, a, a benefit, economic benefit and also security benefits. So uh, uh, while we are working on to reduce the plutonium and managing the international control, we have uh, uh, 200, more than 250 tons of plutonium uh, in the civilian use. So why don't we stop? Why don't we agree on the moratorium on the uh, plutonium separation while we continue to uh, struggle with the plutonium stockpile? Thank you very much. Fantastic. Very concise and effective, so time for questions. I'll take three at a time, so then we'll, we'll go for another round. Brief and concise like the speakers. Please, sir. <laughs> I will be brief, but I have things to say. Uh, the trend has been that reactor building is Partly because of uh, costs, partly because of post-Fukushima effects, which in turn go into regulatory agencies, which in turn increases the cost for these reasons. And there are problems in flammable, there are flammable problems in uh, Finland of Riva reactors, and finally the bankruptcy of all these reactor companies. What I wanted to comment on is, as was mentioned already, I think, by Sharon, meanwhile, uh, fission, if not the sun, rises in the east now. Uh, China, you know, has uh, the world's, half the world's future reactors are going to be Numbers are 41 planned and 21 under construction. This is 60 reactors. And in India, our Prime Minister coming back from Paris made the announcement that 63 reactors by the age, 63 gigawatts by 2032. We have only 8 gigawatts now. So there are very ambitious statements from why are they making this? I just want to make Thank you. There are two things that go into it. Both are controversial, but fortunately, I'm neither from the government nor from the government. I'm not a diplomat, so I can say. One difference is the emphasis put on human safety. There are differences. Uh, people in my part of the world, nobody would say so, are less fussy about this because there are other more important dangers to the populace from lack of electricity, from darkness in villages, what have you. So this reduces to some extent some of the concerns that have gone into this. The other, of course, is the cost of labor. And the reason why India and China hope to get away with not all that they've proposed, but maybe even half of what they've proposed is because the costs are cheaper. So we have an agreement with Ariva, if Ariva survives, to build it partly with Indian collaborators. Chinese have already have agreements with Westinghouse of training them in situ so that they can build it. So I think the reasons are different. And as Sharon pointed out, it's nothing to do with the old East-West political sure. issues. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Trezza here. First row. Uh, thank you. First of all, I fully share the very lucid analysis made by Sharon, really very updated and realistic. But I have a question for Dr. Suzuki. Uh, the recipe that you propose for Northeast Asia, in fact, could be extended to the whole international community. But then uh, just to uh, mention that uh, some of the features that you have mentioned already also exist in Europe. Um, you mentioned ABAC uh, for mutual uh, verification. In Europe we have uh, uh, Euratom. Uh, we already have a, a kind of multilateral uh, uh, enrichment uh, facility, with which you mentioned, Urenko. So uh, something is also going on in other regions of the world. Thank you. Christopher. Uh, a few quick points on behalf of British Pugwash. Uh, first of all, I think we should, we should say that we, after all our studies about the, what, what's involved in meeting the Paris agreements, uh, we see a very important role for nuclear power during the next 20 years, uh, and therefore we do not buy Sharon's arguments about how re renewables can sa safely t take over from, from nuclear. I, I think there was not agreement in the working group, but... Right. <laughs> uh, uh, secondly, in relation to Tatsu's points about uh, uh, plutonium, this again is a subject which uh, British Pugwash studied intensively and produced a paper about four years ago. 
uh, particularly on the British stockpile. And uh, we looked at three options. Uh, one was uh, continuing to store the 100 or so tons of plutonium that we have in Britain, uh, but just with suitable defensive measures to, to prevent, prevent uh, uh, unauthorized access. The second was converting it progressively to MOX uh, and s selling it to approved nations to, to burn in MOX burning reactors. And third was that deep uh, dis disposal uh, with no more than slight remedial treatment. And we concluded that all three options had serious problems uh, and that it was not possible at that stage uh, to recommend any one of them to the British government. However, we did emphasize first that uh, uh, protecting uh, a large plutonium stockpile against terrorists is an increasingly difficult problem and it's going to be a very expensive problem in the future. So the countries that do want to go down that route do have to think very seriously about the sort of terrorist attack that might be uh, initiated in the coming years uh, and have suitable and necessarily rather intrusive uh, military measures to protect it. Uh, and we, the second, Christopher, we are really short on time, yeah. so I need uh, to... And I so both of the other options have uh, serious technical and uh, 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 public relations concerns which need to be addressed. Thank you. I take one last uh, question on the first row, this gentleman here, and then we'll go back to the panelist. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Cesar Jaramillo with Project Plowshares in Canada. Thank you to the speakers for the excellent presentations. As I'm sure you're well aware, the, there's a long-standing deadlock at the Conference on Disarmament, and one of the casualties of that deadlock is the failure to negotiate a fissile material cut-off treaty, or a fissile material treaty, whether or not it's a, actually a cut-off treaty. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the prospects going forward for actually negotiate, negotiating a, an FMT or FMCT inside or outside the Conference on Disarmament. Thank you. Sharon, why don't we start with you? Okay. Raja Rahman, I'm not sure I caught everything that you said because that microphone was a little wonky. I think you said why are, you know, I India and China have very ambitious growth programs and what did I think about that? <laughs> Well, okay, so in the case of China has, has had, a, so far, a very good record of meeting its production schedules, but even it has scaled back its um, production. And in part, that's because of, uh, um, I think, it's declining energy. I mean, their, their GDP growth rate is just not as high as it was. Um, India has never really met its targets. It's had very ambitious... Uh, plans over time, you know, three stages of the fuel cycle. I fully expect both of those countries to continue doing what they're doing. I mean, nuclear energy will certainly um, be built in, in, in certain countries, and, and clearly, you know, for, for both countries, they have a big need for electricity. Um, when I think about one or two other questions, why don't we have Tatsu answer some of the plutonium things? Thank you. I, I think I have uh, two questions, uh, uh, three questions, maybe uh, <coughs> uh, EU. Uh, yes, uh, actually, as I said, in the 1990s, uh, we studied very carefully whether we can introduce similar scheme like a Euratom in the Asian Pacific community, like Asia Tom, even the, uh, Northeast Asia too. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at that time, Japan is much, uh, uh, stronger uh, favoring the reprocessing and uh, there was a strong restriction uh, on uh, South Korean even in China on the reprocessing and also uh, the safeguard scheme there are some countries who don't want to have a double layer of the safeguard scheme so it didn't work out <coughs> there was a, a difference of incentives and uh, uh, schemes on the uh, regional <coughs> scheme but this time um, although Japan continues to maintain the reprocessing policy, the incentive has been much, much smaller. And uh, uh, we are also proposing a Northeast Asia nuclear core freezer in a longer term vision. And this could be a one way, uh, the regional uh, inspection scheme, which is more cooperative scheme rather than uh, authoritarian, I mean, uh, 
uh, additional layer of the safeguards. And so it's a regional com cooperation scheme. Now I think there are more, incent more uh, willingness to talk about this, particularly the Korea has been, been, South Korea is very interested in this scheme. They have visited uh, Argentina and Brazil several times officially. And Japanese also uh, is interested in. So there may be a chance to introduce the regional scheme. It's, it's more, more cooperative uh, type of uh, scheme than uh, Euroton. And for plutonium option, yes, I agree. There are many, many technical difficulties. Um, not only Japan and UK, uh, if the France reduce the number of reactors, they may have uh, difficulties in meeting the, uh, the demand of uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, consuming plutonium from reprocessing. And, and the United States and Russia has a military plutonium stockpile problems. So I, that's why uh, I think it's a good time for uh, all these countries who have a plutonium stockpile to work together. And not only one country is to deal with this. Is, uh, it would be nice to have a joint R&D on the plutonium dispersion program, or if one country agreed to have a dispersion program, uh, maybe we can ask that country to dispose plutonium. And so I think it's a good time for us to think about the international plutonium program together. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to make a brief comment on FMCT, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, zero chances, I think, <laughs> of going forward in the conference on disarmament. Um, but let's just recall that, you know, the five nuclear weapon states are pretty much not making any more of this material for weapons. Um, that leaves, uh, and my understanding is Israel also isn't, that leaves India, Pakistan, and North Korea. So <clears throat> my idea is why don't we just come to a global consensus that uh, we need universal safeguards on all enrichment and reprocessing plants, all of them. So then anybody who's making that material just has to place it on safeguards. Okay, how do you get North Korea there? Well, that's another topic for another panel, but uh, I'm happy to correspond with you on that. All right, we have time for another round of questions. Ambassador Sultania here in the first row. Thank you. Well, I commend the uh, very useful information given. A couple of points. First of all, it was it would be balanced if you had one in panel pro-nuclear. Uh, nuclear energy is the most environmentally friendly energy as IAEA reports. Zero carbon emission. This is a reality, scientific reality. If you have a problem, then we have to work more on safety, safeguard, security. If we have millions, even billion people are killed with a car accident or airplane, we cannot say let's stop and use horses from now on. Then let's go use option and then find a ways to do it. For plutonium, I remind in 80s, when I was 82 in Vienna, there was a very serious discussion of IPIS, Inter IPS, International Plutonium Storage. I don't know for, for some reason this was disappeared. Maybe we can think about it. That is a good idea. The last point that, of course, I, I want to say, the huge amount of application in medical, agriculture, and industrial of nuclear energy. Billions of the people without nuclear energy cannot be treated with their cancer or any problems. That is that we don't say nuclear energy, nuclear energy. Even nuclear power, where 400 power plants are producing electricity. The only thing I suggest is to be realistic, to be to have scientific approach, how to promote the safety to prevent the accidents. After all, three accidents in the history of nuclear energy, TMI in US, Chernobyl, and Fukushima compared with other accidents in other industry. We have to be realistic to work out together in a better. In this forum, we expected to, to give proposals which is, I mean, tangible uh, results and foreseeable. But anyway, I do respect with all your viewpoints. Thank you. Wow, I wish you were on, on our working group, Ambassador. Uh, the gentleman here in the back. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Kenta Horio from the University of Tokyo, Japan. I have one quick uh, specific qu question to Ms. Kasoni, and particularly on your views on the potential of SMRs in shaping future of global nuclear industry. And I remember yesterday the Secretary Moni said some, he had some sort of SM, uh, hope to SML, and particularly I think in the context of 
dividing Western nuclear industry or U.S. nuclear industry to, to shape them some sort of nuclear uh, order to the nuclear energy market. But and I understand that not only the U.S., but Canada or U.K. or maybe China is also investing into the SMR. So my question is whether you think that introduction of, if the possible introduction of SMR to the nuclear market will be another round of technical or commercial competition, or could be leading to the, some sort of international collaboration underpinned pinned by the, those technologies. Last question on the back. Hello, uh, my name is Erica Simpson, and I'm a professor in Canada at Western University. Um, I wanted initially to react to Sharon's comment about the FMCT and no possibility of it proceeding. That's quite shocking for the Canadians here, including Cesar, because that's something that we've been working toward for the last 10 years, and that's our flagship. That's what we want. But my question is for uh, Professor Suzuki. Because in Canada, we sell reactors. We have the largest operating nuclear facility in the world, which is, in, which is called the Bruce Reactor in Ontario. And currently, there's a proposal to bury all the nuclear waste in Ontario beneath that reactor. And that proposal will be decided upon soon. I am wondering, given the experience of Fukushima, what you think about that proposal. Thank you. All right, let me give the floor to you, Tatsu. Uh, <coughs> I have to also respond to the FMCT. Um, I see uh, difficulties, of course, the negotiation of the FMCT, but the, because of uh, 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 the now nuclear weapon ban treaty is now adopted, which includes, actually, I assume, the ban on the f production of fission material for nuclear weapons. So uh, uh, it, it has some dual you know, overlapping functions, and uh, I, I, that will, may encourage, actually, the FMCT negotiation. Hope. That's my hope. And the question about the nuclear waste in Canada, I, I, sorry, I don't have much uh, information. I don't know much about the proposal, but I, uh, there are two issues. One issue is, is the process of uh, 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 selection of the sites. If, if that is uh, uh, done in a very transparent and democratic way, it's, it's a Canadian uh, citizen's decision to do it. Technically speaking, uh, the uh, waste disposal near the nuclear sites has some merits uh, because there's already a, a appropriate site for nuclear facilities and uh, the risk of uh, uh, accepting nuclear waste uh, could be uh, more reasonable for the local people. So technically speaking, that may have some merits, but uh, the, the problem is not technical. I think the nuclear waste problem is more uh, political. So I'd like to hear more about this, uh, how this decision has been made. That's more probably more important. Sure. Sure, Ambassador Sultania, I can't resist. I'm not suggesting we give up cars for horses. I'm suggesting we give up tanks for those scoozers that we saw yesterday at the expo, those <laughs> electronic or solar-powered scooters. No. Um, I take your point, and obviously nuclear energy has uh, um, nuclear power d distinguishing between nuclear energy for a whole variety of uses. I would, I would never say we... Uh, Shouldn't do that. Um, SMRs, uh, can I say this in public? I'm not sure where Ernie Moniz uh, is getting his data on the cost effectiveness of SMRs. I, I've heard him say that before. Um, I haven't actually analyzed that data, and I would wonder where it's coming from since we don't have a lot of them deployed. So. Um, I think his point was that there's a question about the cost effectiveness of smaller units, right? There's a reason why we go to one gigawatt reactors, and that's economy of scale. When you scale it down, the question is, are you getting, you know, what you need, and is it... So he's right to question the, the conventional wisdom, which is, if it's smaller, it's just going to be more expensive. Um, but I don't think the data is out there. I do think there's a lot of interesting um, designs and they are 
thinking about security and safety and you know you don't want to go for more higher enrichment uh, for some of those designs so I, I think the jury's out I don't actually think it's gonna be a huge game changer uh, I think it could support the industry a little bit for a while um, but uh, not a huge game game changer thanks all right, I think we really need to close down, unfortunately. I think you'll agree with me that this has been the best run, most concise panel in the history of Pugwash. <laughs> and for this, I really Thanks want to, to commend you. the speakers and myself, who, although I'm Italian, I do care about time management from time to time. So I really want to thank the speakers, and I hope you'll join me in thanking them as well.